thank you for coming again and again and again. We appreciate that. If you want to come up to the table, and I, uh, Mr. Youngman, I know, I believe, did you invite anybody else to come and discuss CB1? Um, we invited the board. So, and but Ms. Catrunio, would well, you like to well, join? Well, we specifically invited the chair, not poor Ms. Catronio um, that just sort of shows up. She is our vice chair. I know. To be clear, we invited representatives of the board. Okay. So, and we invited Vic's members here on of her own accord the because the board didn't know they were invited. Yeah. Ms. Catronio is here on her own accord. Yeah, so um, we will pick on her, but just <laughs> making think, it clear that she didn't necessarily show up as the board okay. representative. So, but she is a board yeah, so she is same. a board but member with knowledge as opposed to speaking on behalf exactly. of the school board. Did we reach That's out to Ms. Hanks? Yes. Okay. Uh, but it was only on Friday we reached okay. out by both email and phone. Okay, so we reached out to so. the board secretary and okay, then um, so. or administrator. And then we and we've also we also asked for school construction for staff. For staff. For not specifically, asked for well, we asked for Scott Washington right. and Renee Caymans and representatives of the board. For today. Okay, for today. so we asked. But it was late <laughs> notice, admittedly, my my responsibility. So we asked Ms. Hanks for representatives from the so. board and for mm -hmm. Mr. Washington and Ms. Cayman. But so. but that said, um, Mr. Brano has created some wonderful tools for Is us. Is your microphone on? Could you yes, make sure you're I'm just, okay? I'm just quiet, which is not normal for me. <laughs> Do you so need a Diet Coke? We, we should probably, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot even with who's here, you know, for what it's worth. We'll work okay. with what we have. Okay, yeah. I know you said that you had a page worth of questions, Mr. Youngman, so um, and, unless, Ms. Walsh, if you wanted to start since it is your bill, it's up to you. I don't need to start. You know me. This bill was tabled because some members of this council wanted additional information. We received on Friday afternoon an extensive spreadsheet that purports to give us some information as to the length of time that projects remain in the school bin over the last 10 years. So we have attempted to put that out. Uh, we tried that on Friday with marginal success. It should be out and available to the public now, at least in a PDF form, not in a manipulable um, spreadsheet. I'm not, I mean, I assume, Mr. Youngman, you asked for that data to be compiled. I did. I did, yeah. and it was like could not have been more perfect that it showed up right before we were about ready to talk about it. So well, I, I would have preferred it a couple it. of days before that. So I yeah, spent I some time with it, but I would appreciate just an explanation of what it, it aims to be, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then and then perhaps go from there. If I could clarify, we did get it converted into a non-sortable PDF format, and it was that we did get up on Friday. But we got a, a much cleaner version of it this morning. I am, um, and I had probably sorted it by length of time before you came out of the school bin, before I saved it and sent it to you guys, just because it was, I think it might have been by date before, so it was just, it was hard to look at. Um, but um, I had asked DPZ for two things. Uh, one was an analysis of, and they actually provided more. I just wanted to know the projects that had come out because they had reached the max. But, you know, we can tell that from the broader information they gave us. And then I also asked them to be prepared to really educate us. And I know we did this at, you know, when we first took office, but walk us, walk the public through the development process from the day that. You know, I say, hey, I want to develop my property to the day that there's a kid on a school bus and kind of how that goes. And I, it sounds like we kind of have that to go to. So, so it was in response to my question that I think we got this and that we have the other thing. And I'm psyched to see it. Yeah, so we can go through. So are you asking Mr. Brown now a question first, or are we going to go I was, through the? We were just kind of uh, going through uh, what we have. Okay. But if you're deferring to me, then I'd say I would love to go through that development process thing uh, first. Okay. 
um, and then we can dig into right. kind of this because this is more apropos to actually the bill itself. I, I I'm not sure if that's going to be part of what they so use or not. Yeah, it can okay. be. Right. So so la at the last work session, um, we did pass out this simplified right. process. So I also I have copies of this if you want to see this uh, again. I approached it more with yeah. him from like a timeline standpoint, like how long does each one of those things take, you know, if all the planets are aligned, how quickly do you get through this process, um, if the planets aren't perfectly aligned, like what's the, what's the average right. time it takes to get right. through the process. And so we, we put together a tool that, um, that shows that. And I could show that on the computer, but before we do that, I put together like a, a summary. So it might make sense to talk about the summary first. And then if there's interest, I can show, show you the, the tool and how it works. In any event, that tool is it's a web-based tool, so we can provide that to you. We finished it late Friday afternoon. So I could demo that, or I can just give it to you after the fact. But in the meantime, we can talk about this, this kind of timeline which comes from that tool. Okay. So we're passing that around, and then we can talk about that briefly. And the reason why I asked <clears throat> this question is because, you know, I, I had kind of always had in my head, I, I was always trying to compare, okay, what's this waiting period to how long it takes to yeah, I'll come around. maybe build capacity or redistrict or whatever you need to do, and then I slowly was starting to understand that there was other components of the process, so I was only looking at one piece. So rather than just yeah. digging into it myself, I thought it might be something that yeah. we should all just kind of right. through. So. so what this one-page um, sheet does is put together some scenarios of the time it takes for a plan typically to go through the, the subdivision process. And this these years that are indicated in here, or these time frames, are based on, um, in this case, it's 10 years worth of plans. So it's from all plans that were approved by DPZ from the year 2010 to 2020. The tool does allow you to go back to the year 2000. So you can go, you can do 20 years of plans. We thought it made more sense to do the 10-year history given it's closer to the current time frame and regulations change. You could do one year, you can do five years. There's all sorts of different things. So this is just an example of the average length of time it takes for a plan to go through the approval process uh, for the last 10 years. The 20-year um, uh, time frame, there's over 6,000 plans. So it's a pretty good sample. And it was a real team effort to pull this together. So I worked with DTCS and their programmers to be able to extract information from our database and staff in my office um, to create this sort of interactive dashboard. And then I, I utilize that to come up with these averages. So the first example is, um, again, these are major, these are typical processes. So um, you can kind of divide things between east and west. It's a little different in the, in the rural west. Um, it's, it's different zoning, as we know, and the process can be different. So the, the first example is, what if you were to build a major subdivision, which is five units or more in the rural west, which is outside the PSA? So, so we basically looked at all RR, RC zones, and what's the time it takes to, to go through the DPZ, at least. Now, before that, there's a little paragraph on top. As you know, there's a pre-submission community meeting requirement. So the very first thing that has to happen, the developer comes in with a pre-submission community meeting, then they have up to a year to submit their plan to DPZ. Once they submit their plan to DPZ... Okay, so this is from plan submission. Yeah, plan submission, it doesn't count exactly. like that. It doesn't count the pre-submission, pre yeah, exactly. yeah. And they have up to a year. Sometimes they come in right away after they hold the pre-submission meeting. Sometimes, you know, they take up to a year. Um, so the, the very first example there for major subdivisions, um, you'll see this ECP slash preliminary equivalent sketch plan. The reason it's a slash is because ECPs really are te aren't really technically part of the subdivision review process. They're called environmental concept plans, which were added later, I think around the year 2013 per, you know, per the state. Um, so oftentimes an ECP comes in at the same time as a sketch as, or as a preliminary equivalent sketch plan. 
So you'll see this 0.58 years, it typically takes about 0.58 years on average to have an ECP approved in DPZ. And then it takes 1.91 years for a preliminary equivalent sketch. Again, this is an average based on this one scenario. Um, and so, and then the next step after a preliminary equivalent sketch is a final subdivision. And if you look at the history of plans, they average about a year, 1.04. So if you add up the 1.91 plus the 1.04, discounting the overlap time of the ECP, it ends up to be about 2.95 years to get, get through DPZ. Now, what if... Mm -hmm. No, so, okay. okay. <laughs> no. And then um, I could be wrong. So we also have our land development folks here, too. If you have any details about the plan, review, they know this a lot better than I do. Okay. So there's questions uh, about that. So was there a question? So anyway, yeah. What if, okay, so what of this work has to get done before you can take your first APFO school test? So the way that works is when the preliminary equivalent sketch plan is um, signed. So once that's signed, then you get take the allocations test. And then is that could is the e, can the ECP replace the preliminary equivalent, or do you ultimately have to get to a preliminary equivalent? You have to get your preliminary equivalent, and you APFO is not connected to the ECP. Right. Yeah. So the fastest I can get to take my first school test is one point nine years. Right, after you okay. submit, yep. So 1.9 years, and I have to take a test. Mm -hmm. and, if I, and if I take that test in the middle of May, then I can take another test very quickly after. And that's, right. that's how people compress this four-year period to, like, 3.1, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. If I could ask us to maybe move, I mean... Those first two categories, I don't know if they really capture most of where the development and yeah. mm -hmm. conversely, the, or additionally, the harm is being caused. So if we could skip down to perhaps major subdivisions within the PSA, we would be talking about something that has more direct relevance yeah, I, I to the driver for this. And okay. then additional to that, I would like us to use as an example a specific project. Because this is, okay, it takes X years. Cool, mm -hmm. let's go back and, and compare that because now we have the data in your chart mm -hmm. and see, all right, well, I know that a pre-submission meeting happened on X date for, let's say, Court Hill Apartments. And I see that they got their allocations on X date and they went into the school waiting bin. And we can see how, how these numbers are matching up to the real world. In, in, again, in a, in a situation that I think has relevance to what, what drives right. this, this analysis okay. in the first place. And if I could add yeah. to that, yeah. I, I think my goal in this was to figure out if everything works perfectly, mm -hmm. how fast have we seen somebody be able to get through this process right. on a major project. Yeah. And so, I went yeah. through think Court Hill mm -hmm. Apartments seems to be blazing through. Westmount got a lot of allocations in a scenario where it sure didn't look like there should have been school capacity. Um, that there are three or four others that popped out just on the chart where I was like, this Oak Hill Manor, um, Longgate... Yeah, so that's a good that's a good point. If you want to give us a that list is of the plans, point, yeah. we can just 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 to keep in mind that that this this is the real world in terms of this is based on ten years. I want present day. This right. is an average okay. over ten years yeah, yeah. across the county. Right. So it's not the real world. It's certainly right. not the real just, world we're running into capacity. Yeah. And this is this is what we were asked to provide for this meeting. Okay. So we can certainly you know, if there's specific yeah. requests from here, take it back and analyze it. Right. But the direction or the specific ask was, what is the average time it takes for a plan to get through the process? Mm -hmm. So Jeff did an enormous amount of work to try to go historically to look yeah. at what the processing times are. I'm I don't, we've never I, even had actually, this information before. I do find it helpful to have yeah. a longer range view because, especially considering we've built schools in the last 10 years and how that's changed capacity, I, I think, yes, we're having localized challenges, but I I generally find the more data helpful, so I do appreciate having yeah. a longer range view and then being able to drill down and looking at what the trends are over the years, what the averages are, and then also where the localized issues are happening. So. Yeah, and the good news is this tool that we created, you can do that. You can yes. do one year, 2020, 2019, 2018. You mm -hmm. could do different zoning. Should what we just pull the tool up? We can pull it up, yeah. I mean, that might <laughs> yeah. be an option. Way to start. I wanted to kind of go through this for the first, but we can certainly pull up the tool. Because this is just a summary of the yeah. Because yeah. I think that, that, I think that you're, that 
you know, this is that this is that last little stopgap in APFO that's supposed to deal with, you know, those outlier situations that, you know, the world didn't change during the time that they were in APFO. And the second question is, why didn't the world change to plan for it? But, you know, how many instances do we have where we kind of hit that wall and the Board of Ed had no options to to make room for it and it came anyway. Mm -hmm. Well and, and also, how can we prevent that that individual isolated school from getting hit with those kids? And mm -hmm. what's changed in July twenty nineteen. So what are things that got through in this chart that would not be getting through now because of the new outcome <coughs> regulations? We have that chart though. Yeah. We approved that chart last last year. No, I, and it's eight eight projects last year got through, failed a test for the so-called fifth year and got through including 252 units up uh, between New Cotton College Avenue. Ms. Walsh, if I could finish, what? I was just stating on this chart so we could look at what got through in the past that would be constrained by the current regulations. Right. That's my point. Not last year. I'm talking about when we're looking at this sort of 10-year look back, there are things that got through that would not get through on the current regulations. And I think that's what we're going to get into when we start looking at Which the thing on Friday. You know, like what what are the specific projects that got through? Look at those last few years. Because it was very telling to me. You look back to 05 and 06, and I'm like, why did we build all this school capacity? All the overcrowding 15 years ago was in the West. I didn't realize that. So anyway, back to these guys. All right, so we're going to take a look at a singular project through the tool. Do you want to do a long gate? Yeah, you want to do a long gate overload? Do you want to do a long gate? Sure. Is that a good example? Well, I don't think we can. It would take some time well, to pull up. We because basically also Longgate doesn't like have kids on the history. bus yet. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah, I, I don't, mean it's not the yeah, problem. That's right. Do Westmount. Do Oak Hill Manor. I, I don't think we could produce that right now because these plans are complicated. One of a good summary is if you look at this, like Maple on South. Depending on the zone, sometimes they go to DAP. Sometimes they go to Historic Preservation. Sometimes they go to the Planning Board, depending on the zoning. So. There really isn't a typical case because the way the regulations are written, there's nuanced. We can come up with averages, and that was the intent of this tool. And we can certainly go through specific projects like Longgate, Overlook, and um, any other one. But we, we can't do it. I don't know the answer right now. All right, here's another example. Court Hill Apartments had its pre-submission community meeting in spring of 2017. It will get out of the school capacity uh, wait list this year. That to me, I can't imagine it going faster. And in yeah. a situation where every school it's building into is over capacity. But I, I see a chart coming last year and it says towns at Court Hill are coming out. I attended the pre submission meeting in 2017. Which schools are, uh, does Court Hill go to? Um, I'm guessing Veterans, Patapsco, Hebron, or Centennial. That's not necessarily inconsistent with the data that we're showing because if you look at the school chart that we sent, most projects were getting out between three to four years. Right. I'm sure it's yeah. not, but I mean, that's yeah, yeah, my no, problem saying, yeah, is I yeah. have right now examples that don't have any bearing to this analysis. And granted, I got this analysis on Friday and went through it as quickly and as much as I could over a weekend. But uh, every time you say average, I'm going to get tweaked, obviously. Every time we've said average for 15 months, I do. Averages have no relevance to a given school and whether a second grader has 35 kids in her class or 18. It just happens to be where her mom and dad live. Uh, and that, that is the purpose of this stopgap that we're here to do. So an analysis, very beautiful, can't wait to see it, based on averages countywide over 10 years. Data is great, but the relevant analysis right now is where overcapacity is still, or overcapacity schools still are receiving new kids, and we're still approving and letting projects out, right? I mean, that, I, this seems like a complete red herring to me. And again, I'm happy to spend, let's have a whole monthly meeting on it, but um, but an average or even a discussion, if, if it doesn't apply to one of the seven or eight projects that are going to buzz out of the school capacity chart in months from now, I don't, we're, I'm not fixing anything. Then the point of my bill is moot. I'm trying to actually 
have the stopgap work as it was intended. And so that's why I, 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 I would, if we can't do it today, then I would like before we vote on this thing next week is have a specific example and explain, you know, why this has relevance. And I, you know, I keep saying them, towns at Court Hill, Oak Hill Manor, um, West Mount, Lower Park got a thousand allocations at once. Like what? Maple on South. It, I, I went instance by instance. You know what's not even on your chart is Taylor Village. The 252 apartments or townhouses that got out last year is not even in your analysis. So I, I really had a hard time once I started sifting through this yesterday to figure out why this was something helpful to my colleagues to decide whether or not we need more relief than the present system is giving we us. Have, we didn't have this yesterday. The chart, the, this Excel spreadsheet that goes back but 10 that's, years. That's the whole second different part of this conversation. This is how fast can somebody get through the development process. That's From an the average. Time that they, I know. Over 10 years. I know. And that's why I, I'm just commenting on, you know, there's, there's, there's two issues here. How, look, four years was chosen for anybody that's watching because that was determined to be enough time for the school to mitigate. And I think we're all realizing right now that the school system can't mitigate in four years. Thus, the problem. But is four years stuck in the bin really four years or is the best case scenario really six years because you have to do a bunch of stuff before you take your first test and after you come out after your last test you have another year's worth of stuff to do that's I want to find out what is the fastest way somebody can blaze through the process and whether that's a problem that we have to fix or are we talking about this four years which can really be three years and a month or whatever but Look, if people with a major sub really can get through this process in three to four years before a kid gets on a school bus, that's a problem. If the fastest somebody can get through, even if they do get their four tests done in 3.1 months, is like six years, then the conversation is going to go to, why can't we plan for open seats in six years? That's where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to mm -hmm. get to that what's the fastest way somebody can get through and you're right you're not going to find it with averages we're going to have to look at even if even if they're outside of the range of averages you're going to say well god how did they get through so fast i'd like to ask miss catrinio a question a couple of questions you have to answer <laughs> um and i don't know if you know the answers but if you do it would be helpful um how long does it take from the time that it is first noted that an elementary school or a middle school or a high school is over capacity according to the percentages that we have to actually build a new school depends if we have the land okay so identified do you know how do you have any idea how long it's taken to acquire land if it's not identified I, I'm not gonna I can't answer okay that you can't that would have been a nice Scott Washington question yeah if I mean I haven't but, an but idea we're that also back to this old narrative <laughs> yeah, of the only thing we can do talk about a red buy herring. land talk about money. a red herring yeah. stop development until we have enough money and a place to find 60 acres and 150 million dollars to build a school well no I mean, exactly. we've gone we on where we have yes. tons of capacity we options don't. on existing properties <laughs> the board options. of ed we sat in this room a year ago and said start talking about alternatives i just got a i just got a report from pg county it is a 40 page report on P3s and the way they're shifted money from systemic from non-systemic to maximize their money from the state all these things that in a year all all we heard a month ago was deviate from the general plan stop development until you can give us more money and more land now we're not going to have that discussion today because the school systems I hear today and in their defense you know sometimes things get crossed up they're not here but I, I think that we do have the opportunity with these guys to focus on how quickly can you really get through this process well I actually would like to have Ms. Cutrino finish answering the question that I just asked and I would like her to address the comment that Mr. Youngman just made which was we have tons of capacity and, and I we have tons of capacity options to at create sites. capacity 
so that are more than just Ms. going Katrina, out could you school. please respond to that? And just so you know, we argue about this stuff all the time. I know you so do. I know exactly Which what I know Ms. Catrino is more deciding than how nice I'm going to, be. to respond to that. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and I've had conversations about P3 with Mr. Youngman also, and also with our own staff. Um, PG County n has a lot of buildings they need to build, a lot of need, um, and you need a lot of projects for P3 to work. And I think that the conversations that our staff had last year, I think they did have meetings maybe with staff from PG County, um, was that we didn't have enough in the pipeline or enough to make P3 work. Certainly, I am totally open to um, exploring that with, with um, our counterparts and having those discussions. I think we do need to think outside the box because certainly we don't, what, what we're doing now is not working. And um, we did build a lot of capacity um, in the early part of the, the decade to the point where we had thousands of seats available. We're now at the point that we don't. We are in a negative, um, and that has come because we ha we're not building any new capacity for three years, which has never happened before. So we do need, but that being said, even if we had um, these alternative methods for capacity, that doesn't help us today. And if we do build new capacity with P3, then we won't need wait times. Right. I mean, it, the, it's moot, so it's it's a, that's the problem is that that it's all great, all these different ideas, but it's not going to help us today. It's not going to help us next year or the year after. Now, you said that, that there were, that three years, we don't, could you? Three years, well, we're yeah, not building you, any new capacity. Wait, and, that, that. <coughs> and what's happening in those three years? I just want to um, We've been high school 13, we're the, our high school 13, hopefully Talbot and Hammond. Mm -hmm. And we'll have more and capacity then. Right. But, but we they, don't have anything else in the pipeline after we that. We have no additions. For more capacity. We, we don't have a renovation in addition Excuse at Oakland me. Mills Middle. Better we, uh -uh. They, it keeps, believe me, it keeps going no, I know, but on and off in the uh, CIP, depending on funding. Dunlogan is supposed to be an addition along with the renovation, um, but that is keeps getting pushed out also. They all keep getting pushed out because of um, lack of funding. Because of lack of capital. The next true right. standalone capacity project would be elementary school 43, right? <laughs> and middle school 21. Well, and, and, that's, and that's another part of the but conversation with them is it certainly makes sense when you're going to renovate a school to add capacity. That's terrific. But we're now limiting our, our capacity increasing priorities to places that also need renovation. So before I can get those next hundred elementary school seats, I have to have the $45 million it takes to rebuild Talbot Springs. When we've added, we've done 200 seat additions to elementary schools over the last few years that cost eight million and five and a half million respectively. And it's like we've deviated from those ways to do additions on the schools that, that don't need a massive number just to kind of get that extra hundred units. But again, I, I, and look, I'm not trying to take it with me, but I feel like this is a two part conversation. How quickly can you get through and then how quickly can you prepare for it? And if that's the mismatch, then you have to you have to get into AppFill and fix it. And we have the ability to kind of answer that first question today. Well, I think we've also deviated because in terms of absolute numbers, there is capacity at elementary and middle. High school, we hit the wall in 2022, but then we open high school, 13. Um, it's not a lot of capacity, but it's there. And I think the other thing that gets missed along these conversations, one of the reasons it is important to replace schools like Talbot Springs is that you have elementary schools at the small end for 361 students, 377 students, and then you have 826, 799. We have huge mismatches in terms of how the size of our schools across the county, and I think that that's another challenge we're running into. Um, but it is a challenge, and that's the point of I'm CB1. Agreeing. I'm saying there is a challenge. If there, if there is a lengthened period of time, then those schools will get that relief that they need during the time that they need it. And the places where there is capacity, we can allow development to move ahead. Well, I think and the question is how do you solve it? I think that that's the way that 
and there are different ways to solve it, and one of them is CB1. No, sure. That's, I thought that was the purpose of the discussion today is do you just change the number everywhere, one size fits all solution, or is it a localized issue where we have this? I mean, you look at the, the chart they sent, and you can see which schools are getting hit over and over. And yeah. so, you know, how do we ensure that there is relief for those schools that we're building in to make sure that's possible while still getting the capital needed? to build those schools, to build the capacity, um, and ensure that communities that want investment can still get investment. Well, if you see another way other than putting a lengthier time on CB1, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I mean, I thought Ms. Markovitz brought up a really interesting one where you talked about, where she talked about localized percentages, you know, where schools are wildly out of balance and there's no other place to send the kids to. So, like, regionally, like, if you're at 122 and everyone around you is over capacity, like, that's a problem. There's nowhere to go. So like, regional means, moratoriums like Montgomery County? Is well, that no, what you're they suggesting? Don't, they don't last as long. Like, it's... Everyone who looks at it looks at it and says that that's Montgomery County's approach isn't as good as ours, but not that ours is working perfectly. Let's be really clear. Um, but we would at least have a longer and better planning opportunity. But I would say you could extend the length based on the regional capacity. If you're looking at again, if you have a school that's at 122 and everywhere around you is is also high, like that is absolutely a situation that needs relief. So you know just trying to be more specific about it versus uh, well, it would, it would be specific if CB1 passed because it would only apply to that area no because it would change the wait time all over and so then but if, if you there wasn't a longer wait if if there wasn't over capacity in another area then it wouldn't change the wait time it would be the they whoever, would be on it yeah they could proceed if that's how you feel okay I you know I and, and look, the world's changed in the last two or three years where we used to say, look, you have to redistrict, you have to build capacity, and that's getting harder and harder to do. We're now realizing that, you know, I, a, a year ago I said, why in the world does it take five years to build a flipping elementary school? Well, then to find out that it takes you two years just to deal with the state. So, you know, we know that that's a challenge. We just did a big redistricting. And if you look at a lot of these projects that came out and what were overcrowded schools, they are not. You know, just like we stopped building schools, we stopped redistricting. And there could have been redistricting to open some schools. However, as you're seeing on this that Ms. Catronio just gave out, this is getting to be a harder and harder yeah. option. You know, when you're operating a system. Disclaimer, that, it's my own spreadsheet. I mean, it's. You know. I'm auditing. Once but again, I, we recognize you, you are representing yourself <laughs> as an individual school board member and not as the school board. But it is based on the feasibility studies. Not, you know, not thank long you. ago. We appreciate this information. Not long ago, we were operating at, you know, 96, 97 percent of capacity in the county. So you knew that there were seats somewhere, even if you had to do some shifting. You know, the, the it, it's harder and harder to solve what is even a very localized problem if there's nowhere else to go, which yeah. I think is why we're having the conversation. There's a lot of zeros. You know, so. Zero capacity. A lot, there's a lot of minuses, right? Am I reading this chart? Minus. This this is projecting yeah. available seats in elementary schools in 2021 to be minus 60. The following year, 375. Minus 2022, 375. minus 325. Sorry, 2023, minus 672. By year 2024, school starts September 2024. We're projecting, based on the feasibility studies that are out and about, that we're going to be short 1,066 elementary school seats. And that's with the new high school, well, that's with the Talbot, hopefully the um, 100, I think 188 seats at Talbot. And we have similar deficits for middle school, starting with a deficit of 558 in 2020, a uh, high school deficit of 1109 that improves to only 500 seats short by 2024. Um, but the middle school by 2024 is, we're short 972 seats, just in middle school. Well, we opened Th Thomas Viaduct basically at capacity. It opened at capacity, right. didn't it? I mean, yes, when, and that was the first middle school that we built. And we built a lot of capacity for elementary school 
a lot of thousands and thousands of seats for our elementary school between additions and new schools, but didn't keep up with them. So now we're we're starting to see the impact because those kids do go on to middle and high school. Yes, and they we, do. Yes, they so, do. Um, we hope you, you'll yeah. see that even after high school yeah, 13 really is really built so. and the Hammond expansion, hopefully, um, we are still negative at the high school level. This is overall. I mean, this is certain parts of the county, but this is just to this show overall, that we are not. Yeah. Before no. we did have the space to redistrict, we didn't when we should have, and there's no there's no question about that. that there was there were that we should have, um, but that being said, we're at a point now where that door is sort of closing. We're just going to have to shift kids around a little bit, a little bit here, there, and then when you have a big development come on, you know that makes it harder to um, adjust capacities. Mr. Like Brown, now you look are, like you're ready just, to respond. I just work, or, as a question, is that so? That analysis is based on the capital budget. So what the, it's the plan, feasibility study? The feasibility, so it's, it's, it's the, the projections, okay. and I, I compared yeah. to the Maryland Department of Planning too, just to see um, how we because we're not exactly right. aligned okay. with them. Yeah. And the av the overall number is about 300 sheets seats different um, between Howard County and the Maryland Department of Planning. They project a little bit more, I think, at the elementary than we do. But okay. overall, that's they project even more. Yeah, mm. what, I think one, I put that in there. One thing to keep in mind, I think, is um, those projections which we give our housing unit projections to the planning office. Um, those projections um, could be a lot more units than will actually come on, only because of what we're recently seeing with the APFO, which was effective in July 2019. So what I'm saying is that the projections that we gave the school system um, could be higher than what's being realized. We have some sort of uh, indicators of what's been happening since July 19. And I think we, uh, this was presented to the Spending Affordability Advisory Committee. And I think it was uh, also shared with the County Council and, I, and we have it, um, we certainly have it. But basically, if you take a 10 year average of um, pre-submission community meetings from the last 10 years, about every six months, there was about 23, I think, pre-submission community meetings, totaling about 750 housing units, which makes sense because we've been building about 1,500 units per year. So every six months since 2010, about pre-submission meetings come in with about 750 units. Since July 2019, which is when the new um, school capacities began, lowering the elementary from 115 to 105, lowering the middle from 115 to 110 and um, adding the new high school test. We've had seven pre-submission meetings with 38 units. That's between July 19 and December 30th, 2019. Which from a unit standpoint is 5% of, it's yeah. only one snapshot. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's what I was gonna ask Ms. Catronia, was this, this <clears throat> chart plan numbers under old APFO or new APFO? And I these are under old, old APFO, I think it's right? Old, yeah. yeah. Well, it's from June 2019. That's when we present it, so. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to ask so them. So the, if the key is we need more yeah. capacity. Because yeah. we, lo we lowered, because <laughs> they lowered the APFO limits to, to get challenge. these numbers down to give us the time to catch up. Right. And the school system. But again, that's still from a county standpoint, and I, it might be a little bit of an issue with this chart, but it still doesn't deal with the what's going to slip through. You know, what, what's going to be the isolated one that's, that waits longer, waits the four years, and, and now is going to come through. With no capacity with no capacity at their particular school. Yep. And some you know, of the what's the right solution of, you know, I don't think it's fair to look at the whole region because you don't want to redistrict a whole region right. for no. one, but do, do you have to look at, you know, the school that's right next door or something like that? As um, well. As far as like a couple of the projects, um, I think it's the Court Hill one, it's Ellicott Mills Middle is, the, is what's stopping those projects. And now they're 
you know, on our CP, we put Ellicott Mills as an expansion when we have Patapsco that needs a renovation. We have um, Oakland Mills High and Oakland Mills Middle that need renovations. And because we need that capacity so desperately at the middle school level, those projects are getting pushed down right. yet again. And they've been waiting, Oakland Mills has been waiting since 2009 uh, for HVAC 11 years. renovations. That's 11 years. Time. We wouldn't allow that in our own homes. So um, that is the issue, is that now we're desperately needing middle school capacity we don't even have a project really in the pipeline, but we're going to have to put an addition on it, veterans or elegant mills, because of these projects coming online. And what so was I, I'm sorry. Well, I okay. Just, I found it. So it's page seven, page eight of the feasibility study. We have, as a result of this enrollment growth, the capacity utilization of all elementary schools combined will begin to exceed 110 percent by 2028 if new elementary schools are not built. And then for middle schools, it says, as a result of this enrollment growth, the combined capacity utilization of all middle schools will begin to exceed 110 percent beyond 2030. So I just wanted to make sure that I have citations for the my previous statistics that I brought up. And then last year, I do appreciate bringing up Ellicott Mills because one of my issues um, last capital budget was that we had the Ellicott Mills addition when we have Oakland Mills built in. I always transpose high, which was 74 and which was 76, but they're built in the 70s and they bordered each other in terms of their enrollment boundaries. So I think Mr. Youngman and I were checking and I'm not sure they do anymore, but, um, and Oakland Mills is a middle school that has 560. It's one of the smallest middle schools that we have where other middle schools are much larger. So we, and even in the feasibility study, it's only projecting, I think, 150 seats at Oakland Mills where you could make it a lot bigger. And, it, and attract a lot more of, um, certainly, you know, for that capacity. And post redistricting, it's got capacity. It, it but again, we free up. We why didn't we free up more space? Oh, well, Ms. Catrino, Oakland, Oakland Mills is an old. I was hesitant to fill up old schools with, right. with capacity because it. We're praying over those HVACs and <laughs> facilities to to. We're that, stressing that them out. But the sense. state doesn't seem interested in funding our projects if we don't. If you know that capacity is that golden goose for the state, well, it's now they've done this changing, 21st century. They're, do, re, they're rethinking that, hopefully, and they're supposed to be assessing every single facility in the state, which is taking a lot longer than they thought to start doing that because they they realize that, um, or they that yeah, that's they these older about schools that. Yeah, fall winter off makeup. the radar. They have a and then a you end up paying card. more mm -hmm. because now you've got things that are breaking and you know you you have to spend more for deferred maintenance than you would have if you had taken care of it in the first place so the IAC does not want to contribute to systemic renovations anymore they don't want to contribute to roofs as though those things don't exist but anyway the point is um, that if we're going to be pursuing those those state funds then I think we really do need to be um, looking at how we can add capacity at our existing schools and I appreciate the desire to get the capacity out but I am loath to um, further put schools like Oakland Mills Middle, Dunlogan on the back burner while we, because we're prioritizing that capacity. And it is harder to, and it is harder to get that edge in an old school. I mean, an overcrowded St. John's Lane Elementary School is different than an overcrowded veterans because their hallways are a third of the size and you know, everything's just so much smaller. So it's not just about the classrooms. On your schedule, too, um, this is with or without relocatables? Without. Okay, so this is without relocatables. Um, what, uh, how do other counties deal with relocatables for sort of isolated? I know we use them as permanent capacity. We shouldn't. Um, but to deal with kind of these isolated blips in enrollment you know, to maybe buy time before another redistricting or whatever it is. Are we the only county that uses relocatables? No, we're not. I think every county uses relocatables. Um, but some counties use state-rated capacity as their capacity, and then they, they relocatables are counted as part of their capacity, I believe, um, and preschool spaces and, and all that. We don't. We use local-rated capacity. And local-rated so capacity in a lot of these schools is higher than state-rated capacity, mm -hmm. right? Um, it depends. Like high school, it's not. So, um, and we're the only county that uses local rate of capacity at the high school level. Because I hear that that's a criticism too, that we're, we're showing higher capacity numbers than if we would have used the state numbers. Not, 
it's you don't think not across the okay county i hear the criticism but i also am loath to change our capacity i am loath to change <laughs> i i prefer to calculate the way that we calculate it <laughs> sorry i suggested it but no 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 I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I, i'd I'm say recognizing that there's a buffer but yeah, no. i prefer our an analysis numbers. was done like i think in 2016 of of that very thing and they said that we are doing a good job with the capacity that local it was appropriate and then it's good. um so I, I would be loath to also change at this point that would cause miss walsh do you have any questions about these charts or comments no no i mean i, I think it goes by I mean, I, now we're talking about high or middle school renovations it the purpose of this bill was to tinker with the very last stop measure measure that is available by code. The code outlines specifically five tools used to manage growth. Um, redistricting is not one of them, but it is what we have also reverted to as a sixth tool. This um, countywide is in fact in application a localized stopgap measure for those circumstances where a particular site-specific development is building into one or more site-specific schools that will receive those new students and are in all likelihood, you know, if, if the school capacity chart comes into play over capacity. Um, I think, I thought one of the things we were going to get into today, again, was specifically how does this work? Not right. on a, not on like a, an average thing, but I, I wanted to know like, hi, I'm Johnny Home Developer, and I, here's my plan. So do I look at the 2018 thing, or do I pick the year that I say I'm going to be done? And I look on this chart, and I pick that one year that Ellicott Mills isn't projected to be over. Like, I would, I would have liked to have seen exactly how that goes through the system. Because again, picking the ones that cause me the most anxiety, I would go back and look at that chart that we got over the weekend, and I, I can't make it make sense, you know, because I see school, or I see projects building into Burley Manor, and I see, you know, a 2015 project saying that there's capacity at those local schools, like Centennial Lane, and, and I know there's not. Yeah. So I just can't, I can't connect the dots to even see that even this system I'm trying to tinker with just a little bit, if we need it, works at all. If anything, this thing has scared the bejesus out of me. And I, it, I mean, it looks like the Wild West. Well, I will say that um, we did um, add capacity without adding capacity with um, reassessments of capacity with Gilbert studies. So, okay. all right, so when they needed Burley Manor, okay. suddenly the capacity was increased through okay. a study. But it was a blip, wasn't it? I mean, it, it was, was a like, blip. no, 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 no. Yes, capacity, Elkridge no, Landing, no, 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 Burley no. Manor, yeah. there were schools that, they did it for elementary school, I think in 2013, I, I think I have that referred to on my chart, in middle school and high school. High schools were all 1332 capacity until I forget what year, and then they were increased without increasing the footprint. I mean, I it's still, in question. some cases, was it is a concern totally to me, too. I mean, we've got thousands of apartments coming in in downtown Columbia. We just approved 300 market rate apartments in another part of Columbia. We approved a 48 unit apartment complex over off of Grace Drive. There's a request right now for another 230 units um, on Cedar Lane. You add all that together, and we're looking at maybe. 9,000 uh, units that are coming in within a very small radius, a two-mile radius from the schools that exist right now. And I can't help but think to myself, and my understanding is that um, the Howard Hughes development is not subject to APFO. I think that that was part of their um, legislation is it's, it they, it's subject to the schools test it is subject, it, it is to, subject the to the schools test, test okay yes. so they could <clears throat> potentially have to stop at some point right because yeah. of the schools test that's thousands of units I I mean are we gonna build another high school well, next to yeah. Wild Lake High School right. or another high school next to Atherton High School yeah. I, I mean again I guess if there's Atherton just got renovated so I Right. don't know that Atherton would be the right school to renovate but I, I mean these are the these are issues that seem to be mostly impacting district one and district four um, that you know we're Laurel we're, Park we're, Station thousand apartments okay <laughs> coming to Rowan um, <clears throat> and they, yeah, and they, they added keep in mind, down, to downtown too, Columbia which is more students is you know it's a it is a 30-year plan so yes it is 6,200 units and I think about 1800 have been built so far so it's about a third of the way so it is another 20 20 year plan 
So that's important. It is. A lot, it sounds like a lot of. It is a lot of units, but it is a thirty-year plan. It is a lot of units. And then the three hundred units that you just approved through the zoning case, um, that probably. So it's a ten-year plan. It's a ten-year plan exactly. So. And I, that, you know, the the it's a ten-year plan, but people keep coming. You know, right? People no, move it's, in, it's people it's move true. out. It's yeah. apartments. It's yeah. rentals. Yeah. So that's not yeah. like that's ever going to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a house, then you might. You know, people move yeah. in with kids. The kids grow up. They go through the system. They stay in the house. You know, then right. So there's no kids, which can work. But you're looking every one of these units that I'm talking about are apartments. People rent. They come in with kids. They leave with but kids. But it matters. They come back in with kids. Right. The size. That's if it, that's, it's a three yeah. bedroom versus yeah. a studio. Yeah. Well, I'm just thousands. I'm just saying, if I'm in a okay. studio, I'm not I having mean, my three year old and five year old. Uh -huh. Overall, we're looking at you know maybe nine thousand units, and that's a lot uh, of apartment units to add yeah, to we one nine thousand yeah. units. In could I um, could I no, just ask a clarifying thousand. question yeah. about the spreadsheet? Uh -huh. sure. um, the school capacity that's listed is that the school capacity today or when that project came so out? So that that's based on the chart that was adopted at the time that it came out. So okay, so yeah, I'm really exactly. concerned about. I mean, I know this is 2005, but the um, Hollifield Hills, formerly Rome Long property, mm -hmm. where it came out into a school that was 130 percent capacity at Hollifield Station. Station back in 2006. Is yeah, that, was that the year? Yeah, it's, if you. I mean, like those are some of the right. projects where it's like that. That's a problem. So the reason we wanted to set up a sorting is because if you look at the twenty-year history of these plans, it's a lot of plans, and the number of schools that have been held up, or number of projects that have been held up the max time between three and four years. You can see time periods. So you can see around the year two thousand six when we actually uh -huh. had a lot of growth. We had this issue that's being expressed where, where you have projects coming out and meeting the maximum. Then there was a gap. So um, it's 3.7. That it yeah. hit its maximum because of the situation that Mr. Youngman described where it's like you take it in June, you take it in July, right. and then you do your other. Okay. Yeah, because it's based on the, it's, it's five tests, which ends up being between three and four years. So four years max, three years, gotcha. three years, one month, something like that is the minimum. Yeah. Okay. But you can because, see. Because like, yeah. I see things like that, and that's where I'm really – Glad we're having right. this opportunity because that's the stuff where it's like we need to. That's a problem, right. and I think and then, we all yeah. agree that's a problem. And then you see the bulk of it in the history of AFO happening right around now, and that's in large part because of, the, um, as um, was indicated, that we're not building the schools as fast because we're having capital funding issues and all of that, which is trying to be. Addressed. Plus, more and more of the capital money needs to go towards renovations, which used to not be the case 20 years ago, but now schools are 40 years old, so. 50% or more of the capital funding is for renovation. So it's a real challenge, no doubt about that. Yeah. Although that is one of the reasons that we structured CB42 that way, so we could, based on the growth needs within that, but within the CIP, that we could be going after those funds um, to support these growth projects because we need the new homes to essentially pay their fair share. I, um, I, I, I know we're eventually going to run out of time. and. Mm -hmm. My colleagues yeah. know that I, could, I would talk about this all day. Days on end. But I think that <laughs> We're gonna need more I, think, five I think my District 1 colleague and I kind of <laughs> both have the same question still outlier, which is, and if we can't talk about a specific project, I get it. You know, let's hypothetically, no, based on your specific. million years of experience, let's spend some time talking about with a major sub in the PSA how quickly somebody can get through this process. What do they need to do and how long does it take before they take their school test? How much of the approval process can they be working on while they're in, mm -hmm. you know, APFO lock? Mm -hmm. And then how much, once they get released, do they have to do at the end? Okay. Yeah. So well, that, I have a what's that one. turn into? Mm -hmm. well, what about the Sunel property? Um, in 2018, Sewell? West Sunel. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sunel. Uh, it's 38 oh, yeah. units, right. 3.1, Hollifield, 114, Patapsco, 114. Patapsco. But see that that we don't we don't know. I mean, we see how quickly they got through the APFO, but we don't know what they had to do before, what they had to do after, whether they're allowed to work on whether they're allowed to kind of go do, down two paths concurrently, 
Right. Well, like, let, let's tease that out. How does so, that work? Well, that's a good, so, so now is, a, is, I'm looking at it now, it looks like it's. Is that perhaps go overlook? Is that 38 units? Yeah, it's the 38 so it's a, units. It's 20, a major. Oh. Oh, that's days and then. No, because that's big. Wait. Yeah, the 38, so it's a major subdivision. <clears throat> so that would apply to, um, to get the, to Mr. Youngman's question. And what Ms. Walsh was asking about also is this is an example of a major subdivision within the PSA. So it's the, you can see where that is there. All residential zones except R, R, R and RC. So the typical process is it would come in with a ECP slash sketch plan. And the reason it's slash because people can submit their ECP at the same time as their subdivision plan. So a typical ECP takes 0.51 years to process. A typical sketch. Oh, actually, that would be helpful if we go down this and say yeah, how that's long. That's great. Like plus minus. Would that be helpful to anyone, or is it just me? Okay. What year is that? Oh, okay. It's just the subdivision process. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I think we have extras sorry. of these. Yeah, Mr. Brown, them around. Ms. Gowan, if you could sort of give us an idea of how long each step takes like that was really helpful to say it can be as little as that like you can submit them concurrently it can be as little as this it could be a most as this because I mean Mr. Youngman sells houses but no one here is ever I, I own a quarter to. acre that's all I'm ever going to own before I move to a condo so I don't okay. know I've never I don't develop homes so knowing this is helpful right okay and that's what this was attempting to address with this yeah I don't know that we can do that off just okay blanketly because we weren't asked that question in advance. So the data that we pulled, you know, Jeff summarized the question we were asked in advance was what's the average time? So we have the data. We, he was able over the weekend to do the analysis of the average time, but we'd have to go back into the data to look at what's the minimum, what's the maximum. And if, if we could at some point pull up the chart, because I think what we would like to do is at least show you what the capability is of this model yeah. that you can then have, and then you can run different scenarios off of right. it as well. Although it is looking at the average time, so we probably would have to take the raw data. Yeah, we could we could do a, a min a min max then, easily with the data. And then maybe replicate the right. tool with that information yeah. as well to get a range. So you you're prepared to show us on the computer. We, we can but, do that right okay. now if you'd like. You if you'd like to do that. Tool. Okay, we have yeah. a couple more minutes that we can devote okay. to this. So why don't you show this to us so that we can then run our own analysis? Okay. As you said, since it's available right. to us, right. we could then run our own analysis. Is that laptop? But Director Gowner, is this going to be on like the DPZ outward facing web? So other. We, Others besides the five of us on the council can actually so it's web based, so we'll show you the link and you could okay. share it with whoever you want. Okay, yeah. but the department is not doing that. It's not there now, no. Computer. We just finished I mean, this over could, the weekend. I, we, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a brand new, it's a brand new thing. So we uh, could post it. Okay, sit over somewhere. There. Yeah. I don't know where, but we could. Right. It, but okay. otherwise, we'll provide it. Great. The more tools we have to analyze this, the better. We appreciate that. But a good thing is I think we have the data to look at the minimum and the maximum, so we just have to go back and analyze the data. And then we can just provide that kind of like we did with this summary. Okay. And we can also do the specific examples of the projects we were asked. That's that would be helpful. Test cases. Well, while he's doing that, I just wanted to point out that when we ran the when we ran the data, the ECP um, was showing an average of like half a year. I think that's high, and you know, I, my presumption is that because it's not part, it's not te technically part of the subdivision regs. I don't know that the dates going in were entirely capturing real life scenario, mm -hmm. so. I, I don't think it takes half a year to get through an ECP process. I think it's much shorter than that. I just don't have the empirical data. Right, like if there's one that is a huge outlier, it could be dragging it all up. Sure, sure. There's no deadlines. Yeah, there's no milestones. And that's the issue is like there's no milestones in the subdivision regs like there is for every other plan stage where 
you have 45 days to resubmit, and then we have 45 days to review it, and then everything is, there's a that deadline changed. and a milestone associated with every plan stage except ECP. So okay, it could well take a month. It could take six months. Six months. And because we allow concurrent submittal with like a sketch, sometimes it can just lay out there on its own. Okay. So it's hard to estimate exactly how much time that would add on to the front of the process. But for everything else, there are milestones. So Correct. we have a much more guarded idea. Right, exactly. So exactly. then for your... Um, the step three and four. I'm sorry, which one are you on? Major subdivision. I'm on major subdivision. Okay. Yeah. Step three and four. Yes, they're milestones. So how long would those average the, in terms of what you looked at? Right, oh, so according hello. to the summary. So there it is, like magic. Yep, yeah, there you go. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Brown, now that yeah, is amazing. Go. Right. There we go. That's right. And then... Um, James Wilkerson. Thank oh, it just disappeared. James Wilkerson created this. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Data. Wilkerson. So, right. Oh, no. That's not good. I know it's not good. And now it's gone. <laughs> and then Jeff oh, wait, messed wait, it wait. up for you. It disappeared yeah. Actually, just let me, like let me try that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. It like hops in from the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the way this works, it goes back from 2000 to 2020. So there's about 6,000 plans that were adopted or, or approved in that process. This is all zoning, so this it's a, this is a bit a little bit odd. And if it's does not does that have commercial as well? Then yes, it does. Okay. So what you can do is what I did for the analysis on that one page sheet. I just selected the, the you know for the outside the PSA, for example, these two zones. Oh my God! I'm gonna have so much fun with this. So you can do it by zone. So you can analyze commercial as well. And there's a way to. I'm used to a mouse, not to this thing, but let me see if I can do that. So there's outside the PSA. And then if you want to do more, if you just want to do um, more recent times, 2018. So there's 83 RRRC plans during that time period. And then if you just click on here, it tells you an average time for a preliminary equivalent is 1.26 years. And that's by the time the, the plan is submitted. And then... Um, it, it includes multiple submissions. So oftentimes the plan is submitted, DPZ staff review it, and it's not approvable yet because there's issues. So we put comments, and the developer has a certain amount of time to bring in a new version of that plan. So sometimes plans come in you know, two, three times. So this is from the initial plan when it's first submitted to the plan, the time it's assigned. And that's the average, average time period for that plan. And then for ECPs, it's, it's 0.95. And that's based on real time. So it's um, ECPs, as, as um, Amy had mentioned, they're really not part of the subdivision review process, so there's no milestone dates. But this is based on our data, what the time it takes to, to approve an ECP. Um, Mr. Brennock, when yes. you, instead of saying ECP, could you Environmental remember concept to plan. say okay. that for yeah. the okay. people who right. are watching at yes. home? Thanks. Environmental concept plan. And then a, a site development plan, abbreviated as SDP, takes about uh, 0.89 years. And there's seven of those that were approved during that two-year time period in the West, which are actually it's very atypical to have an STP in the West. They're probably like forest con plans or something like that. Um, and then, but a final plan is is about 0.64 years. So you can select different zones and different time periods and come up with a with an average. Oh yeah, and then these links. That's a good point. So we added these links here. And this is good for the public too, so ah. the public can see the processes. Yeah of the different, which we, which is the, the same thing as a printout that you have. Can you, you go to this and clear out the filters and click on RA15 as a zoning? That's a good um, idea. As, as a zoning. So, uh, I'll just go 2010. <clears throat> which one? I'm sorry. RA15. RA15. So 28 and 10 years. And then and can you snug RA15 that up? And RA15 for the purpose of the public is? Residential um, 15 units per acre. It's, the, it's one of the highest, higher zoned residential developments for apartment units primarily. Can okay. you snug that up to like 2017 to 2019? I'm trying to isolate down to courthouse. And I'm hoping we get up to where it's one. I don't think we're going to get to that, but... 
Um, so there's eight. Okay. Yeah. You know, so maybe this is an indi at least an indication of a. I tried to pick something that was kind of narrow. So what what is that showing? It's showing the cumulative of those, uh, the two plus plus the ECP time plus the each of those columns add up. Right, so in this case, um, the sketch plan, two came in with, the, there, there was two sketch plans that lasted for about 0.7 years, and then um, the final plan was about 1.14 years, and the SDP is that. So typically from sketch, um, and oftentimes for RAPT, they go directly to sketch because it's not a subdivision. So that's why there's no typical because the regs are such that sometimes, mm. depending on the type of plan it is, if you're not subdividing property, mm. which you're not in an apartment mm. complex, yeah, you oftentimes mm -hmm. you, you know that, so you just go straight with the with the SDP. Mm. So yeah. it's actually goes more quickly. Then. It could it could be quicker. Yep, okay. it could be quicker. Yeah, it's and, good but to you can know. see here they're also more complicated. So it, that's why the number is a little higher, 2.23 years, for these these particular ones because um, it's oftentimes the very first plan that DP would DPZ would see, and it's it's if it's you know, 200 units or something like that. There's a lot involved in reviewing that plan, so the the length of time can be longer. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. With these number of plans going into the averages, in developing these, were there many outliers? Were there many? So, for instance, did these number of plans hover around the average, or was were there like a huge? So that's yeah. Range or IQR or that's a really good question and, and I don't know. So that's the thing we can maybe James, can we build that into here? <laughs> yeah, kind of a range, like a range or something like. Yeah, like for instance, shortest. so so like here we have number. And this is by the, by the way, by the way, I know you're like, <laughs> can you yeah. just yeah. make it? But by the way, this is awesome. Yeah. So thank you. It yeah. really helps. Yeah. So number of plans seven, average time is two and a quarter years. Was there a situation where? Like these are kind of hovering around two to two and a half, or was it a situation where one was like five, one was like a couple of months? Yeah, those you know, are all just to those are all great questions, and we don't have it. We just did a we just did a quick average, but yeah, we, yeah, we don't have. The, but the data is there to try to come up with something like that. Yeah, maybe James can opine on that. <laughs> I just thought it'd be helpful because you don't. I know, I don't know. We're like. Speculating, and I recognize Can you that when you're identify yourself, it. please. It, oh, okay. Thank you. No. Okay. Uh, James Wilkerson, I'm a planning supervisor with the Division of Research in Planning and Zoning. Thank you. So, a couple of questions have been asked, and we first we thank you for creating this tool. It looks like it's going to be very helpful in many ways, um, and we thank you for sharing it with us, um, Ms. Gowan. It's uh, very nice to see something like this. And uh, so if, if there's something that you think can be done that would further refine this tool, is that possible along the lines of what Council Member Jones has just asked for? I just like doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you say I just like, I just like <laughs> building it all the Okay, it is Monday morning. <laughs> I've just been watching a lot of hearings and stuff lately, so it's just it's very official. I don't get a lot of opportunities for that, so just trying to make the most of it. Um, so a quick disclaimer, I don't give simple answers. I'm very sorry about that, but that's also part of why I do what I do, um, because things aren't really uh, often black and white. So. There's a lot that can be done in addition to what's already there. You want to know the minimum and the maximum that would help you identify outliers, that can be done. You want location information associated with this, like plans based on council districts and whatnot, that can be done. That would take a little bit more time. It's just, it would almost be better instead of me telling you what I can do is for you to just submit a series of questions about specifically what it is your asks are. When you're okay. looking at this data and thinking about it, how would you break it down? What is it that you currently don't see there or you would like to see expanded upon? And then we could sort of take it from there. Because, you know, this was something that was put together, um, you know, in a day based on an ask uh, that I got, based on an ask that was received 
to the department. So really it just all depends on what the ask is and looking into the available data, how it's formatted. I can't just simply say yes or no. Based on a couple of things that I've already heard, yes, we can do minimum maximums. Outliers would be eight. You know, we could isolate those, remove them, or just report on them. Um, so. Thank you. That sounds great. Well, we can come up with those questions and keep you busy probably for maybe two more days. I don't know. Uh, Anybody who can put together something like this in one day, I, I'm pretty impressed. So, uh, and, the, and the more that we could do these kinds of tools, these interactive dashboards, yes. uh, the better for communicating and, yes. and to play with. Because it's, it's one thing to have a static piece of paper, yes. but the more that we could do this, the, yeah. the better. So that's what yes. we're trying to do. We're this trying is to create great. It, yeah. it really is. We do really appreciate it. We didn't want to give that without an expl explanation. I understand. There's a lot to it. There is, right. yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, we're going to finish up here. So are there any more questions? Because we're moving on to scooters, gentlemen. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, there are really housekeeping questions. Not for you, James, sir. Unless you did this <laughs> Thank question. you, James. Would you yes, like to turn you, the microphone on and off one more time? <laughs> thank you. We'll let you, take, we'll let you take that off. <laughs> the, the spreadsheet that we got, um, there were just... Uh, again, this issue of outliers, if you sort them by school out, in general, every year on July of some date, there are a bunch of them. But in some years, there are other projects listed as having been school out outside of the annual July cycle. And for example, in 2019, it was Dorsey Overlook being out in May of 2019. The year before that, it was Quarter Square being out in May instead of July 2018. I yeah. just wondered what that is. And then I also noticed, um, because I would tend to sort by allocation just to see where the biggest the damage numbers, is being yeah. done. Yeah, I see 1,000 at the top, but then there are a whole bunch, again, Dorsey Overlook's one of them, that have zero, zero allocation. So I just, we don't have to do that now, but I, I would be interested in knowing how, what a zero allocation is even doing in a school capacity been in the first place but those were just my didn't understand it over the weekend kind of stuff we can look into that and get back to okay. you okay yeah. yeah so I guess the Thank next you. steps at this point are for us to go through this and then come back to you with our questions so that way we can best use the tool to answer the questions all right and and I I mean I know that we don't have to do this but Given that we are going, we don't have another work session on this, and we will be voting on it um, shortly. To the extent that our council colleagues feel that they are comfortable sharing whatever information they get from DPZ, I think it would be really useful to all of us to um, share that information as opposed to keeping it to ourselves. That's how I roll. Thank you. Guys. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.